Happy Halloween, everyone. Gojin the Makai Phantom approaching ya. So it's that time of year again. Time to dust off them cobwebs and get ready for a spooky time. And by that, I mean five minutes with your mom. But comment down below what you did this Halloween. Some of us like to delve into horror media like movies, shows, or games. Others like to go out with friends and get drunk at parties. If you're younger, you probably go trick-or-treating. Or some of you might like to scare yourself by having rape fantasies with Professor Otaku. <laughs> it's ugly bastard IRL. Or perhaps you just enjoy delving into urban legends such as ghosts or cryptids. If so, have you heard of the Inukai Tunnel? Probably not if you aren't a filthy weeb, but this myth began its roots in Fukuoka Prefecture back in the 1990s. The tunnel is up there with that of the Suicide Forest as one of Japan's most haunted domains many are too afraid to even enter. But legend has it, behind that tunnel is a village where supposedly the rule of law does not apply. This is due to the citizens taking issue with the constitution, thus nobody who enters will ever return alive. Is this the Inukai Tunnel or Diddy's Basement? With such an ambiguous legend, there was an abundance of room for creativity in form of a horror movie. And who'd be a better choice to showcase that than genre juggernaut Takashi Shimizu, the master who brought us the Juon series, Reincarnation, and more. This brings us to 2019's The Howling Village, the first from a trilogy of loosely connected horror flicks mainly sharing the concept of a cursed village based on real urban legends, with a few nods to the audience of all three taking place in one universe. Having established the context, now's the time to explore just what makes The Howling Village yet another terrifying gem from Master of horror Takashi Shimizu. The plot revolves around young psychologist Morita Kanada, played by Ayaka Miyoshi, who embarks on a quest to uncover the mysteries surrounding her brother Yuma, who went missing in the infamous Inukai Tunnel. Driven to grief and loss, Kanada finds herself troubled by these stories due to the horrifying events that continue to occur. Thus, she ventures to uncover the truth, hopefully find her brother Yuma alive. And Jeffrey Epstein's killer. Shimizu has made it clear that he aims to tackle more than just horror. I mean, he has. This is why there's usually an element of tragedy to be found in his work, to elevate the fear and evoke other layers of emotion. This approach creates a more immersive experience for the viewer, allowing them to feel a range of things beyond mere dread. <laughs> But at its core, the Howling Village is horror first and foremost. It is, however, activated by these heavy situations to get the ball rolling, though. It makes for a smooth pace that takes its time for twists and turns, with moments that show there's other things in life besides that tunnel. They just find themselves intertwined with it in some way. At the beginning of the movie, we are teased with little things like shadows, arms, and everything in between. But for the most part, we are left with the character's reactions before it shows us nothing is there as far as we can tell as the viewer. But that's why, as the camera teases us throughout the film, it manages to be twice as effective, leading to the final result being earned. present in many of Shimizu's flicks, namely Juwan, and that's his ability to just sneak in unsettling imagery within the backgrounds. These details can be easily missed on first viewing, but that only makes spotting them twice as horrifying. Later though, you'll find out not all of this is what it seems either, which comes back to the elements of drama we talked about. But Shimizu does this intentionally to build suspense for what you'll inevitably find out. Which is smart, as it gives us time to see everything through the lens of our cast, including things we won't fear later, and it kinda captures that feeling of times when you're alone at 3am. You don't have a clear image of what, but something feels off. 
It also should be complimented how most of the activities are rooted in logic, despite the horror genre often being laughed at for characters doing retarded things that nobody would actually do in these situations. Which all I can say to that is, have you seen real people? They still think Andrew Tate is innocent! Oh, I want a virgin wife at 16 who's gonna obey me. Anyway, none of that is featured here, luckily. The part with the child having bad dreams, he says to keep the ghost of his mother a secret, and while he refers to her in front of other individuals, it makes sense why they wouldn't raise an eyebrow for anything deeper than him talking about his adopted one. While the writing and directing work together to create a dark, cohesive narrative, the Howling Village is not without its plot holes. There's some messy bits that, as of now, I don't see how anybody could properly piece them together. Look, I've watched this film twice in a row and three times in total, and while I've garnered a better understanding over time, I'm still left with unanswered questions. Like, what's the connection between the dog curse and the vengeful spirits? All we know is back in the day, they locked women away and spread the lie that they fucked dogs. But how does that make them into these were-dog-like entities? Are they even spirits, or were they just granted eternal life that gives them the ability to attack ghosts? It's confusing, and I don't know if that's what Takashi Shimizu intended, if it's something about the mythos I don't know, if I missed a thing or two presented in the actual text, or if it's just bad writing. However, one could argue that Maya is cursed to keep giving birth in the Inukai Tunnel, condemning her offspring to a canine fate unless they are released from the cursed land, as this is supported by the establishment of the girls being rumored to mate with the dogs, and the cinematography's focus on the creatures before it shifts to the newborn. Granted, I am not confident in this conclusion, since it raises other questions, such as what was happening by the end, but there is evidence in favor of the position if it's one that resonates. That being said, the intricate narrative offers a compelling exploration of themes such as identity, loss, and the supernatural that should please anybody looking for a little more with their horror, despite it does leave more questions unanswered than I believe it aimed to. However, while the writing and directing lay the groundwork, it's the actors who bring the characters to life, making them feel real and tangible. Since they're the first people we're introduced to, I'll begin with Akina Nishida and Yuma Morita, played by Ryota Bando and Denko Otani. Right off the bat, the two are able to communicate how close they are. Even if they're not on screen together a whole lot, from how both speak, there's a level of playfulness around their interactions, from the jump scares to the hamming it up for the camera, but you can also notice a bit of awkwardness in her gestures. Constantly moving her eyes around, quietly speaking, really bringing to light their lack of familiarity both with the place and the camera, which showcases some degree of unease as the paranoia begins to kick in. All this gradually gives way to the somber demeanor as we witness the forest's impact on her mental state. Once they make it back in one piece, there's a lot to read from the character's emotional turmoil. Inu. Inu? Inu ga nishimukeba. Oa higashi da kedo. Inu ga shirokereba. Through her straight face, soft-spoken demeanor, and the haunting look in her eyes, it's as if the forest experience has regressed her to a childlike state of vulnerability and fear, which again, complements Shimizu's build of suspense before actually revealing anything. While Yuma Morita's choice to return to the tunnel might seem reckless, given his first-hand experience with the evil shit that lurks there, which it is, his grief and desire for revenge motivate his actions. It's understandable why he would seek retribution for what that has taken from him. Basically, what I'm getting at is his decision is by no means logical, but his reasons for pursuing those actions, 100% is. Deep down, Yuma is well aware that this is a losing battle, hence why he wants Kulta nowhere near that domain. But he's at such a state of loss, he doesn't give enough of a fuck about himself to not do something stupid, especially when you top it all off with the harsh words he's received already, putting himself somewhat at the blame of it. Kanata Morita, from start to finish, you get the feeling like she knows something supernatural is happening but doesn't say anything because she doesn't want to believe it, nor will anybody believe her if she did. She hardly ever smiles, and when she does, it's forced because she's trying to get kids to talk to her. Don't take that out of context, we ain't discussing Dr. Disrespect here. 
This is thanks to actress Ayaka Miyoshi, who brings depth and nuance to her character, allowing her to evolve and grow through the course of the film. She maintains a perpetually brooding expression, her voice often low and subdued, as she attempts to blend in while feeling constantly surveilled. But these are for a handful of reasons. First is the fact she's often seeing these spirits from the corner of her eye, second being her brother who returned to the Inukai Tunnel, and third comes back to some deep-rooted trauma she's held since she was a kid that her adult mind tried to lock away. Kanata does have other priorities in life, but they become entangled in the mysterious events surrounding the village, and because of that, she eventually lets us see her emotional side, conveying how done with the scenario she feels. <laughs> She's angry, she's sad, she's horrified. It is this complex blend of emotions that drives her to investigate the village and uncover the truth. All this works because she starts to remember things she's seen as a child, and the supernatural becomes less scary since now she's understanding it better, motivating Kanata to take action. So okay, so okay. So ばあちゃんが<笑> I'm in danger! But it also requires swallowing that fear and pushing herself to confront them, since at the end of the day, it's still unusual even when encountering entities without malicious intent. Which by the end, her language is more calm and relieved. It's the first time we see her have a genuine smile because as far as she knows, the curse has been lifted and those spirits she originally felt uneasy about weren't all evil. So that it. Ah, shit. Here we go again. The one area I found her performance slightly underwhelming was during the reveal of what actually happened. It isn't bad per se, but it doesn't stand out compared to her delivery through the rest of the movie. What do I mean? The shift in tone isn't a whole lot different from her usual. Just some tears, a little bit of yelling, that's it. <laughs> Which I guess is passable, since the performance already seemed like she was holding some baggage, but it doesn't really tell me how big of a deal this is. At least not for the unveiling of the mysterious event she's been suspicious about from beginning to end. Then there's Akira Morita, who makes sure to leave a bad impression moment he first steps in the spotlight. Even when you put aside his harsh words, provided by the writer... <laughs> Masanobu Takashima's still fronting face and constant blinking with his eyes gets across how much of a piece of shit grouch he is. This also foreshadows he's got some deeper trauma going back to that tunnel we'll see later. This aggression is 100% motivated by fear, and once the story unveils everything, coming back to this scene is a little more enlightening. His lines of dialogue is what tells us the level of unlikability he seemingly has. Not only being too harsh on his son, but also treating his wife like garbage because because she let him know he didn't have to be such a dickhead. But you learn he's only behaving this way because he cares, and a part of that treatment he gives, while not entirely justified, is he wants to protect his family, regardless if he comes out looking like a bad husband and father. <laughs> which there's plenty of omens sprinkled around with the rest of the old folks like Yamanobe, played by Minori Torada. <laughs> and 
how they interact about the topic is understandably subtle because obviously there's going to be some form of trauma to come with that, and familiar cases starting to show back up should invoke a bit of PTSD, but the language they use should more than get the point across, since both know what happened and for the viewer, it continues to work off the ongoing suspense. Hell, there's hints suggesting that Ayano Morita knows. For one, she's older, and it's been insinuated that most of them are aware. Additionally, when her husband is bowing to the shrine, she looks just as distraught as he is, showing that maybe she shares his knowledge. This would also explain her tolerance for Akita's attitude towards the matter. So Reiko Takashima brought a lot of life to the character, whose role would mainly boil down to being the mother without her. Now here is where spoilers are gonna come peeking their heads in, like Professor Otaku in the woman's bathroom. If you don't want to know a major character, feel free to skip to the timestamp above. You have been warned. Then there's our supernatural friend, Kenji Narimi, played by Tsuyoshi Furukawa, who you can tell is waiting decades for this very moment. <laughs> His aggressive language and emotional outbursts suggest a deep personal connection to the situation, even before the full extent of his involvement is revealed. Rather than relying on exposition, the film allows us to observe Kenji's story through Kanata's perspective, gradually uncovering his motivations and the tragic events that led him to his current state. It's just a testament of how important acting is, really, especially when a mystery like this is involved, but the music is just as much of assistance. The scene in in which Kenji takes Kanata to the barn is accompanied by a heavy piece that just puts you in the headspace of all parties on screen, especially Kenji regarding his love Maya. Even Morita, who's piecing together the puzzle, is finally starting to understand what he's dealing with from an outsider's perspective. So in a sense, she kind of represents us. <laughs> Although Kenji clearly doesn't want to give up the child, he realizes that neither he nor Maya are in any position to raise it. This scene here being a phenomenal example of all individual artists doing their parts to tell the story, from writers, actors, cinematographers, to the composer. Buckle up boys, we're now gonna focus on the works of the composers, Shogo Kaida and Shinusuke Takizawa to talk about why their music elevates the events taking place to great heights. First track we hear sets the tone well. Think about it, up to this point, it's been abstinent of music, this being there to properly inject the vibe of those watching their video. <laughs> But when it comes creeping in, the gradual progress from silence to getting more loud communicates dangers are coming closer. <laughs> and as a result, feels more intense since it almost catches you off guard. During the kid's lone time with the nurse, thank god she's not a school teacher, the slow, low-key score combined with the kid's straight face talking about how he can't reveal his mother's secrets truly captures the unease Kanata is feeling, serving as a proper introduction to our lead as it tells us all the core motivations we need to know at that moment in time, which only continue to get built upon. <laughs> Well, sorry, kid. Mama can go fuck herself right back to hell. But as established, there's an excellent communication of tragedy and loss featured in the soundtrack. When Yuma's mother finds out he's gone missing, it's high-key and dramatic because it says exactly what's going on. A grieving, in-denial mother who hasn't accepted the supposed death of her son and as a result, is willing to put her own life in jeopardy despite the fact it's fruitless. <laughs> it's a similar recklessness Yuma himself was going through if not for the difference of context in key areas, but I digress. Kenji and Kanada's arrival to the village is appropriately soft and atmospheric. It brings to light how they found the place, which not only solves the mystery of what's been happening, but it also carries both of their loved ones. Oh. 
It almost sounds like it was pulled straight out of a Silent Hill game, which also blends horror and elements of drama. But some of the darker tracks are more aggressive, for lack of better term. But the intensity always builds upon the context. Look me in the eye and tell me watching this alone late at night doesn't make your skin crawl. And then I'll message your parents, your grandparents, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your neighbor, your fucking landlord, and tell them that you're lying to Gojin. The sinister sound of chanting gives vibe of doom. I promise this is not a doom reference, coupled with the fact it almost feels like the spirits themselves are singing it. Which, hey, I guess that goes back to the PS1 port of doom with some of the music, but okay, I'll shut up about doom. Speaking of such, the phone booth scene took a lot more talent than you probably thought it did. あの、水が抜けないように水槽を特別に作って撮影したんですけど、中には超えないようにお湯を入れてたんですけど、それでもやっぱすぐ寒くなってしまうので、俳優の出し入れの旅に温めてあげて、しかも後からこう中に入れて
all that said, please check me and the guys out at Sakura Central. This video will actually be available there first, but don't stop here, as we've got a long list of content relating to Asian media, such as interviews, news, reviews, and so on. This is Gojin the Makai Phantom, leaving the building. Rise, rise, rise.